guys uh back again i know it's been a long time and but the interviews for the youtubers core members are still going on and uh here today we have uh youtuber member serpentine 451 how you doing today sir i'm doing uh fantastic actually Ugh. It's a good day, not like any other day. Just a Friday, nothing more. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Okay, so as we all know, guys, I'm here as a request for the Mount Vernon Kid. I'm here to interview mem the members. So we're going to get to get to know a little bit more of Tony here. So first and foremost, sir, um, your name, how did you come up with your name? Oh, that's simple, really. The origin of my YouTuber name is actually comes in two parts. One, the first part, Serpentine, actually comes from a character I created. And this character was magic-based. But the 451 aspect of my name actually is derivative from Fahrenheit 451, one of my favorite books of all time. Okay. Very interesting. And I use the name for everything. <laughs> everything, everything. <laughs> okay, that's good. So, um, as a most of the, as you all know, the questions for first four questions is always always what I ask for all the members. Um, do you remember the first video you put here on YouTube? Actually, I do. The first video I ever put up here on YouTube was a review of Marvel's What If series, uh, which are in very, and some of them were in volumes, and, one, and some of them were single issues. One of which is, what if Rogue had the powers of Thor? One, that one being one of my favorites. And is that video still up? Yes, it is. It's actually the first video on my channel. All right. As you all know, guys, uh, the kid will probably put, will put a, uh... Tony's a uh, link in his, for his channel there, um, as always. Um, now, when you were invited to the team, uh, who contacted who first? Was it you or was it Chris? Actually, I talked to Chris first because, you know, I've always had such respect for uh, the uh, the combo community in YouTube and Chris most importantly being he's so cool uh, his zenness of it all and he the one he's when I when I initially joined and when when I was trying to acclimate myself to the group Chris was one of the few people I can easily connect with because he was such a laid-back guy and I thought you know what I can easily connect with this person and it would be kind of easier for me Unless some of the other members, I might uh, mess up something and be banned to ever comment on anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was your, what? Can you tell us what what was it like to uh, interact with the rest of the group when you finally first got involved with the group? Like, what was it like to talk to Ziploc Gory and you know? Uh, Many, many of the the original three was you were you available to talk to the original three of the well, core or were you just able to talk to a certain amount of them in the beginning? Well, when I initially began, when I when I initially got my start here, the only two that I had constant communication with was with Chris and Ziploc Gory. I never really got to communicate with uh, Deadpool Zilla when he was still a part of the group. And when he was there, uh, we barely got to talk. And that was kind of one of the things that I, you know, I in a way, regret, is that I never got the chance to communicate with him. Though so people might have, in some chats, may have viewed me as, you know, the, the crazy one, the, uh, one of the few crazy people of the group who was prone to losing his mind. <laughs> now um chris tells me that you are a huge animal man fan is that true that 
That it. That's true. I love Buddy Baker, one of my favorite characters of all time. Can you recall the first time you actually were introduced to Buddy Baker? Actually, the first instance I was ever introduced to Buddy Baker was with the New 52 of DC Comics, and that he got his own title. And I was hearing so much uh, good things about it, and when I actually picked up an issue and read it, I'm like, why haven't I been reading this before? Because like, that got me interested in actually learning about Buddy Baker as a character. And one of the, the one thing that I want as an Animal Man fan is the giant collection of Animal Man stories by Grant Morrison. Okay. So you weren't reading him before the 52. You just jumped into him in the 52. Yeah. It, it's, I, I may have got my... I may have jumped in, but... I kind of grew a sudden connection with Buddy Baker, and that's what makes me a fan of him. Because, one, uh, he actually he still has his family around, even though in current uh, runs of the series in the New 52, it's kind of strained. That's all I got to say. If you actually read the series, you'll understand why I say that. But... It's just that family connection when I initially started reading the series is then that that's what drew me to the book itself. And that made me fell in love with Buddy, uh, his wife Ellen, and all the other and some of the characters in, in that series. And it makes me want to venture on to see some of the classic uh, stuff featuring Buddy Baker. Especially the Grant Morrison run. Okay. <laughs> um, th and speaking of the the group once again, um, are there any members of the group that you seem to really talk more of a daily basis with than others? Not trying to say that you like them better than other, but are there more uh, that you talk to more than the other members? Well, let's see here. There's actually. Like a small, like a collective of people that I talk to the most, but the one that I'm in constant contact with is Slyke388, aka Steve. And he and I have collaborated a whole bunch of times through different through conversation about certain things. And well, then another one is uh, Mr. Lone Wolf, and a few others that. Uh, that will come to mind, but they know who they are. <laughs> okay. Now, you're also a co-leader of the extended team, Bravo team. How did that feel to get announced as a co-leader? How did that feel when you were announced as a co-leader? Actually, I felt very, I felt a large amount of joy, to be honest with you. It's just that I've always wanted to give myself a, uh, like push myself in various different situations and see kind of a test of my character and all that stuff, see what I'm fully capable of. And being named a co-leader of a team uh, gave me that kind of opportunity to test myself and see how, what my limits are. And so far, I think that I handled things somewhat well in my in my run as a co-leader of bravo okay now also uh i've heard that you started your own fan fiction um can you like, give us a little bit detail on what that's all about uh the glorious meridian park when it's actually spelled meridian but you know like i said in my video on revealing this entire fan fiction universe it's just i initially wanted to do something that's on the independent basis kind of like uh, you know how i was partially inspired by two factors one the uh marvel 2012 and the forthcoming dc 2014 uh sites and when I met 
for the first time uh, when I when I went to Whistle World Portland, and when I that was when I met Kurt Yusayek, who wrote Astro, who's written Astro, who writes Astro City and all that and other great comic works. And he kind of inspired, and he and I asked for advice as a writer, and he asked me to actually do something. And with that, I wanted, and with that kind of pushed me to do something on my own. And I wanted to give writer, and the other thing, I want to give writers a chance to create their own characters, to do their own stories, and set it in a world where they can, in the, where it's possible for them to do that. Because, don't get me wrong, writing for some of our favorite characters is great, but you don't get that uh, thrill of writing a story with a character you create it's not the same throw with a character you created on your own. Yeah, it's kind of the fun of it, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Is there any characters that you see today that you tend to be more drawn to or more inspired by in creating your own various characters? Or does it just come off the top of your head? Well, for me, there's some concepts for characters that pop into my head. Because with my vivid imagination, things crop up randomly at times. And I just look at certain characters as a bit of an inspiration. For example, with one of my favorite characters that I created in Meridian Park, known as the Teal Man. Now, in his appearance, he vaguely resembles Captain Adam or Dr. Manhattan. And actually, it's his uh, origin is roughly based on those characters. Uh, other than uh, with those, with the exception that this, uh, the Teal Man was a regular 18-year-old working class uh, guy, whereas uh, Dr. Manhattan was a, a scientist and... Nathaniel Adam was a, a fighter pilot. So it's doing something that's similar yet different at the same time. But there are concepts for villains and heroes alike that are derived from other places, but some of the things that I love is actually the supernatural aspects of a lot of things. I'm more drawn to the supernatural side of comics. So we're talking Dead Man, Etrigan, people like that then, right? Definitely. Okay. And so that pretty much brings us to my next question. Some of your top favorite supernatural heroes, what would that be? Well, let's see. Of course, on the top of that list is Dr. Stephen Strange, the various incarnations of Dr. Fate, hmm, Etrigan, Etrigan the Demon, of course. Let's see... Dead Man's one of my favorites. Uh, Swamp Thing is another favorite of mine. See, and let's not forget our favorite Brit in the DC Universe who chain smokes and is a very capable mage himself, uh, John Constantine. But above all of them, there's one character that's magic based that I love with every fiber of my being. And she is the mistress of magic in the DC universe. That woman being Zatanna. So, oh, I've always, she's a very powerful character. And I just love her classic look that she's a stage magician and also a very powerful sorceress. And that's what I like about her. And plus, she's one of the most, uh, Beautiful uh, uh, DC characters I've ever seen. I vouch for that. <laughs> uh, now, Chris has also told me you're a huge Captain America fan. Is that that I am? <laughs> what draws you to Steve Rogers so much, Tony? Oh uh, well, Steve Rogers as a well, what draws me to Steve Rogers is actually his character, the way he views. Uh, this country, the United States. 
because uh, with the whole Civil War thing, they made Captain America out to be a bad guy for not... Because people uh, usually assume that Captain America would always follow the orders of the government. And with his military background and him wearing the stars and stripes all the time. That's his costume, that's his thing. But in actuality, he believes in the idea of uh, the United States of America. He doesn't care for the politics, even though there's a what if story where he actually became president and in the ultimate Marvel Universe, he's the president. The less I talk about ultimate Captain America, the better, but <laughs> yeah, it's just how Steve, uh, how Steve Rogers views this country is what draws me to him. He's a patriot in that sense, and that makes me respect him. And also having a uh, family in the military also makes me respect Steve Rogers as a soldier. Okay. When Steve was pronounced, quote unquote, dead after the Civil War, were you one of those people who were excited and enthusiastic for Bucky to take over the, the mantle? Or were you one of those crazed fandoms like only Steve could wear that uniform actually i was happy to see bucky become captain america because it's all about character growth uh for me character growth is important and to see bucky become captain america was a kind of a beautiful thing for me to see because this was a character who was steve's sidekick in world war ii Presumed dead during that time, and became became one of Steve's dangerous villains as the Winter Soldier. And when Bucky got his memory back and started working with Steve again, that was a, a great thing to see. And then when Bucky actually took up the mantle, it made me feel happy to know that there's still a Captain America out there. And I wouldn't... And, just and to see someone take the mantle for a friend is or a close friend like that is really heartwarming. So that's the same way. Ha that's the same way I feel about uh, when Dick Grayson became Batman. Now, now many of many of us, uh, as you all know, what's going on now uh, with the big internet buzz, the fact that. Um, Ben Affleck has been cast as Batman. I would like to get your reaction from that, sir. For the honest in opinion, how do you feel about that, uh, truly? Well, to be honest with you, I feel very lukewarm about it. Because we all have to agree that Ben Affleck is a great director. And we can't deny ourselves that with some of the movies that he made. In, in the directorial sense, but Ben Affleck himself is a mediocre actor with some decent roles, but his he has a limit to his acting range. And this is coming from a guy that has been in theater for from his teenage years till now. You can't just go into in play a character like Batman, you have to have a certain presence. And I don't believe that uh, Ben Affleck would have that presence given him to play Batman as a character. As, as a character. But, hey, the, uh, the combo community has been wrong in the past when it comes to movie casting. I look to Heath Ledger as the Joker. But only time will tell if this casting choice was right or wrong. I'm not going to... Because when I initially went on the internet to see how it exploded with the casting choice, I was thinking to myself, this is going to go too far, and people will actually have to... And people will actually lose their minds over this. I'm like, and I, I, I just facepalmed and to the thought of it, it's like, oh, dear God. People are just going to throw a major hissy fit over it all. 
and it's just going to turn me off for actually watching the movie. And I already have ambivalent feelings towards Man of Steel itself. And now you're make you're just adding on to the fact that you're just going to go crazy over a, sim- a simple casting choice that we as fans have no way to control. We don't we don't have the power to influence people that are in Hollywood. We, though we try, but in actuality, we can't unless we actually go into, we go to Hollywood ourselves and make movies that we want to make. You know, it's, it's funny that you said that because there have been death threats already. Uh, people begging to uh, sign pensions to stop Affleck from being Batman. Uh, that right there just shows you how far sometimes the dark side of being a geek or a fandom truly is. Because uh, I truly feel that that is just going way too far. Um, basically, in a sense, uh, saying you're going to hurt somebody physically over a decision you have no say in is just going way too far. Um, Which I agree with you on that. It's It actually shows how... Now, don't... It, I, I may have some views that are controversial to some, some people in the geek community, but I, I don't believe that we should do things like that. It makes me think that it would just show us in a na- show us uh, geeks, comic fans, whatever. It would show us in a negative light, and make us look like uh, petulant children that will not accept anything, no no change whatsoever. They want things to be their way or the highway. We can't act like that as a a community. We're not. I cannot stand for people acting like children over things that aren't even out yet for proper review and observation. It's just something that just, it's news. People losing their minds over news. And that's insane to me. That's insane to hear that people would go too far over things that may change in the end. And those who wa- are going to watch this video, you may hate me. That doesn't matter. But you must agree. We must all agree that we cannot act like entitled children. Because, in all honesty, people can do whatever they want to our favorite characters. We may hate it. We may want to s- try to stop it. But in in all reality, it's going to happen whether we like it or not. It takes in things that we have to deal with and be patient for. We have to stay patient. We have to stay the course, even though the waters are murky. Getting off that topic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> basically. Um, what are some of your favorite movies, Tony? I mean, you're a movie lover, I, I, I'm been told. Uh mm-hmm. Are you more of a horror, suspense, thriller, you whatever genre you're more into? Let us hear some of the movies that you are drawn to and you like and things like that. Actually, uh, there's a lot of different movies that I love from different genres. I actually made a list of my top 40 favorite movies on my channel. And my number one favorite movie of all time is The Evil Dead. My favorite horror film and one of my favorite comedies. Did you see the remake? I did. And and in all honesty, and and here's my honest opinion on it. It does not have any of the characters from the original. It's it's It told its own story, but the setting is similar. And you know what? I would I, I would invo- it's not a remake. 
it's a it's a tale featuring the Necronomicon. It only shares the same name as the series we all know and love. It's its own story. It has its own characters. It has its own plot. So, and it's actually one of the better horror remakes. Well, I won't necessarily call it a remake. It's actually one of the better horror films I've seen in this current era of horror. Do you feel that horror is kind of losing its its oomph as to say as it was maybe in the 80s and the 90s and early 90s or so? Honestly, I do. And here's the thing. It's all dependent on... It's Horror nowadays always been dependent on what I call... Two, there, there are two factors that draw me into the mo- that drew me into horror, is that it's gruesome supernatural stories and mon- and villainous monsters that are hard to kill. Nowadays, it's it's crap like insidious and paranormal activity that are classified as horror. And it's ridiculous and it's annoying. Paranormal paranormal activity is not a horror film. It is a shame attempt of actually making something scary when it's actually not. And Insidious is also is also a a, uh, offender to this modern age of horror using your quote, air quotes. Making me laugh at the main villainous, at the main villain of the movie and how it's poorly designed. It did not invoke fear. Oh, what do you want to know what emotion that it, it evoked when I first saw it? What's that? Laughter. How can I be afraid of this long, gangly thing that I nicknamed Mr. Spinley? How can I be afraid of that thing? Oh, Metal Claws? Ooh, not like I've seen that before. Used for a better horror character, i.e., Freddy Krueger. Now, I've heard from Chris that you and him share a very common love for a certain horror independent movie known as VHS. Oh, true? yeah. Is that true? That, that is true. Okay. And that derives from my love of horror anthologies. <laughs> okay. Have you seen the sequel to that movie yet? No, not yet. It I've yet to see the sequel, but I've heard a lot of things about it. Okay. And well, what I know from it is that it has fewer vignettes than the first one, and that the frame narrative actually sounds really interesting. Out of the the first VHS, Tony, uh, what was your favorite story? Hmm. My favorite's actually Amateur Night, which is the story that features our favorite succubus from the, our favorite succubus from that film lily mm. oh i remember many a night when all of us would gather in a hangout and chris and i would chris would threaten kyle with sending out lily and i was like oh i can't wait to see her she'll be excellent at parties <laughs> is is Kyle afraid of Lily? Honestly, I think he is afraid of her. But he says that, you know, I'm not afraid. Bring her, uh, make her come. I'm not afraid anymore. But I think that's a lie. He is afraid of her. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the the buzz now of every, uh, actors now wanting that? superhero movie on their resume now you find that as a good thing or as a bad thing now in all honesty yes it it, it's actually it's a double-edged sword you have some actors that fit for characters that they that that fit for certain characters like uh it's also the unexpected and also the thing about it is when an actor wants to be a superhero, uh, play a superhero, that's great. Uh, like, uh, 
say uh, an actor has a favorite superhero that they want to play, they can they can go up to those who uh, are making the movie, and if they actually get the part, it's exciting for them, and I ha- and I'm happy for them. But that takes away the opportunity of a unknown actor to surprise us in the role, if you get what I'm saying. I mean, look at uh, Christopher Reeves when he was cast for uh, Superman. He actually, people saw him not as the actor, but as the character. And he was relatively unknown, if I'm correct. But there's a certain magic when you have somebody who's an unknown become a character to view them to be the character that they're cast as is actually quite a sight to see. Then you get roles like Keanu Reeves playing John Constantine, totally changing the concept of the character altogether is a bad idea in concept, like a bad idea, but you can kind of see what they're trying to go for. Uh, I was just about to even ask that to you. Uh, m- uh, in terms of that, uh, rather would you rather see lesser known actor or unknown get the part, or the uh, well known actor? Because I've talked to Chris, and he's always said he sees it more of the the lesser known or or newcomer. They seem to more appreciate the role better, and they will probably they will more likely give their all for the role than someone who is already well established. And you can say that as a double-edged sword as once again, because you look at someone like Robert Downey Jr., who has already been established in the world of cinema for so many years, but Iron Man was really his comeback that put him back on that quote-unquote A-list category. But you look at someone like Chris Hemsworth, who not a lot of people may have heard of, you know, especially because he's more of an Australian actor and his he's not very well known at the time, get casted as Thor. And some will say he did a very good job at Thor and some may say he may have did. But in your view, do you feel that the lesser known or newcomer actor appreciates the role more? Or do you feel that it's better to go to a well-named actor to get more showcase for the movie or so. Actually, it's a it's better for a lesser-known actor or a completely unknown actor to get the role for a superhero film because, like uh, you said, it gives them the opportunity to put everything they can in the performance. Whereas a well-established actor, an A-list actor, would just phone in a performance for a check. Though that's a general observation, there could be some A-list actors that actually do love these characters and want to want to give it their all as well. But the majority is they are just in it for the paychecks. What was your, what's your, what's your out of so far out of all the superhero movies that have come out? What's your most favorite? Well, Captain America, the first Avenger, which was, a, in my opinion, a very good portrayal of, of Steve Rogers and his origins. Uh, the Avengers is one of my favorite uh, superhero films. Hmm. Are you looking forward to the sequel? Uh, for both films, yes. And one film I'm excited for and cannot wait to see when it comes out is Guardians of the Galaxy. Have you seen uh, the trailer for that? Oh, I did. And it made me smile. It made me smile. I was grinning from ear to ear when I saw that. How do you feel about Ronan the Accuser being the main villain in that? In all honesty, I like it. I like the fact that what Marvel, what Marvel Studios is doing, they're, they're building up to Thanos. They're building up to this powerful threat, in which he is a powerful threat. 
you have to build up to a threat like that. Whereas on the DC side of things, their best, th their best when it comes to films are actually their animated films. And some of the ones that I love are Batman Under the Red Hood, uh, the compilation of shorts that they've done. Another favorite of mine is uh, uh, Justice League Crisis on Two Words, which featured the crime syndicate based on a script written by Dwayne McDuffie. May he rest in peace. And, but one live action DC film that I like, and I do honestly love this film, is uh, Batman Begins. Now I've heard now I've heard from many of the fellow members of the core that you were you are a Batman fan but you're not that much of a hardcore fan. You that I that that much is true. Yeah. You kind of feel that he gets way too much spotlight than some of the other characters. That much I can agree that that is true in the sense that People put too much stock in the character of Batman. Granted, he is, he had some great animated series, some good animated movies, and a great trilogy in the, uh, and a decent, well, a great to decent uh, series of films in the Nolan trilogy. But in, in my honest opinion, we put Batman on what I call the golden pedestal. And what the golden pedestal is, is what, what fans, and I do mean hardcore fans, what they do to their favorite characters. They put them on a pe they put them on pedestals made of gold, and they lure and they make them so large that they lure over everybody else. And they say that this character is important because he can do this, that, and the other thing. But in actuality, you have to look at the flaws of the character as well. That's what makes them characters. If you keep putting characters on golden pedestals, you make them gods. And I'm sick and tired of all this talk of that Batman could be anyone with proper uh, train with proper with preparation, time, and all that stuff. And when I'm talking about a one-on-one -on -one fight. These two people never met each other when it comes to fighting a character like that. Batman, in some in some instances, would lose and lose badly. Say, for example, if uh, without proper without prior knowledge, Batman and Black Panther fought each other, who would honestly win in that fight? In my opinion. It would be T'Challa, because one, both men are skilled fighters, but the one thing that T'Challa has over Batman is that his physicality is better than the Dark Knight Detective because of the heart-shaped herb Black Panther took when he was king of Wakanda. And plus, it does, and if it's, we're talking about modern interpretations of the characters with uh, T'Challa being the king of the Wakandan underworld and having access to the wisdom of previous Black Panthers, yeah, Batman would would lose in a matter of minutes. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, what we've heard, once again, the Flash is supposed to be getting not only a movie but also a, a TV series once again. That's going to be a spinoff of Arrow. How do you feel about that? Actually, I'm really excited to see that, being a, uh, a Flash fan myself. Yeah, I just love, in the Flash, I prefer, uh, I prefer Wally West as the Flash over Barry Allen. And that's my honest opinion, because Wally was a character I easily connected to when I was watching uh, just, the Justice League animated series growing up. And I'm like, yes, I relate to this character, even though he's much older than I am and can run at superhuman speeds. 
and I can't run that fast. Now, speaking of Wally West, uh, he was more of the modern age Flash, if you would say that. Uh, do you have respect for the Flash legacy in terms of going way back to characters like the original Flash, Jay Garrett, and the other legacy uh, Flash family? Or is it just because some people I've I have heard just say they just like this one Flash? Or are you those types of people that actually like the legacy of a character? Now, we see that in DC a lot that... Most of the characters, they have a legacy. The Flash, you know, uh, the Green Lantern, people like that. Are you one of those that loves the the Golden Age all the way up, or are you just a clear-cut Wally West, Barry Allen type fan? I have so much respect for DC's legacy characters. Now, I do mean all the legacy characters. Like, uh, well... One of my favorite uh, like uh, Golden Age characters is Jay Garrick, because he is such a cool guy. To be uh, to be honest with you, I just like Jay, and even in his old age, he's still a badass. Most definitely. Do you feel that? How do you feel about that? DC has kind of de-aged those characters now. Brought them. Uh, they're younger now in Earth Two. You know. Uh, Jay is very young. Uh, Alan is not is younger, you know. Any you know things like that. Are do you mind that? Do you mind change to characters, extreme changes like that? Or are you one of those that let it ride through to see where the writers are going to take it? I I actually like to well I like some changes with characters when it comes to how the characterization works in that series. Say, for, well, like, uh, with uh, the whole, with the Earth 2 Alan Scott being gay, mm. I have no problems with that, in all honesty, because I wanted to see how that would work out in terms of the series itself. And it actually works for the, even though they portray Alan as uh, a real dick of a character in Earth 2, but I could still respect him as a character. It did not... The changes that they made did not detract me from reading the book. Okay. Are you into the very Golden Age characters like the Phantom, the Shadow, people like that? Because I know Chris is well into the pulp heroes. Uh, yeah. Are you into I, them as well? I have a lot of respect for pulp characters because without them we wouldn't have the superheroes we have today and it's my honest opinion that we should respect these characters that are such an integral part in our history as a comic book culture you know have you and seen any of the movies that are based off of those characters like the shadow and the phantom or have you missed those movies? I have yet, but I've. But one of the things I wanted to see is the. Uh, I was just to watch and to see how it is, the uh, the Shadow movie with uh, one of the Baldwin brothers. Alec Baldwin. Al yeah, Alec. I actually want to see that to see how how they interpreted uh, the Shadow in that film. I would recommend you watching that. Um, to get your take on it. Um, I won't spoil a lot for you, but I will tell you that they put a little bit more of a supernatural mysticism feel to the character than his, you know, his original origin and things like that, but they still kind of give it a good basis. Um, so I definitely will agree you will like that. Now, as for the Phantom that was starred by Billy Zane, that one... I can tell you right now, you if you know the, the legacy of the Phantom and, you know, it's passed down from generation to generation, you know, you might be a little bit kind of iffy on that one. Yeah. Um, definitely. It's the same and, thing I would, I would recommend. I don't really recommend you uh, watching one of Will, Will Eisner's babies, The Spirit. 
you know, that yeah. was uh, pretty much a very bad interpretation of the character. Which, unfortunately, I have seen that interpretation of the spirit, and I regret ever watching it. <laughs> so I would I would assume that that's one movie right there you regret watching. Yes, I regret it because... Well, to be fair, it was visually stunning. It was visually stunning. That I will give. But in other situations, it would just, it's just bad. It's bad. I can't put, I can't articulate any other words to describe it. It's just awful. And, well, the guy, the actor who played out of the spirit, do not look bad as the character. But it's just... Oh, Frankie, Frankie, Frankie. What the hell happened to you? Why are you this batshit insane? Now, other than theater and comics and movies, uh, you're a gamer, I would assume you are. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm a gamer in the in the casual sense. I don't get many games to play. When I play them, I just play. Th oh, for me, when it comes to certain games, I love adventure. I love RPGs. But the one thing that I love for console games is fighting games. Do you can you recall your first game you ever played? Oh, that's a tough one. First game I. I think it comes in two parts. Well, technically three. The first ever game I remember playing was actually Mario Kart 64 and Super Mario 64. And when I started playing computer games, Command and Conquer, Red Alert, was the first uh, computer uh, real-time strategy game that I've ever played. And I was seven to eight years old when I, when I played those games. Well, Command and Conquer, that is. And I had fun playing Mario Kart with my, uh, with my sister. We just had a blast racing each other. <laughs> oh. And I was always Bowser. I was always Bowser. You like Bowser? Yeah, I, I like Bowser. I do. Something about a demonic-looking turtle just says, yeah, just makes it go, yeah, I'm going to play as him. <laughs> um, tell us your love of the Assassin's Creed series. I know you're a big Assassin's Creed fan, um, just like uh, Chris. So, uh, Where do I begin with that series? Oh, man. Well, I initially started playing Assassin's Creed when I first actually played the first Assassin's Creed game. I did not get into it, but... Later on in my life, I started playing as like, I, I can get into this. I love this. And my love for it actually spun out from the first game. And uh, I was really drawn to the mythos the, the game was creating. It made me want to get the other games in the series. And to this day, my favorite character in the Assassin's Creed series, my favorite assassin, will always be Altair. With Connor Kinway being a close second. Now, Altair was kind of a dick, though. Um, he was, but you can but he was cool, he was calm. He knew what what it took to get the job done, even though he was a bit vain, but you can but we can all agree that he can get the job done. He was the best for a reason. And what, now, now I know you and Chris also, in terms of the assassins, you kind of have like a little bit of a mixed feeling when it comes to uh, the uh, the other assassin after Altair, uh, Ezio. Uh, oh. Where do I begin with Ezio? Chris has said that he felt that Ezio was too much of a playboy. 
uh, type character. You know what? I do agree with him on that respect. It's he's just he's a he's a good assassin, but his personality you would not expect as an assassin. You would count, he, you know to make a comparison. He's basically the assassin's version of Zoro. That's the only difference. That, that, that is an interesting. I have never looked at it. You know what? That's really interesting because yeah, he, now that you mention it, he does remind me a little bit of Zoro. Because the two characters have similar personalities. They're fl- they can be flamboyant, but they are they can be serious. Which, in my opinion, to be the role of an assassin, you have to take that position seriously because if you mess up you wind up dead. Mm-hmm. So, for Ezio to have that kind of personality and be an assassin at the same time, it's kind of head-scratching, in my honest opinion. Now, in terms of Connor, Chris has told me he finds Connor to be his favorite. And I have understand Chris's reasons of why he, Chris has said because of the fact that he can connect to Connor a lot in terms of being Connor is of mixed culture and the same goes for Chris. Um, But he also just loved the progression story of Connor uh, from childhood and up to him becoming the assassin. Uh, And just the fact that, you know, it takes place in during the American revolution, a time when this country was going through a lot of dark days, trying to find its independence, break free of England and things like that. How did you feel about Connor overall? Overall, I like him as a, I love him as a character. His character progression was very it made sense. It was great to see and just to see him become a very capable and brilliant assassin. That was that was great. And just to see him just annihilate an entire platoon of redcoats put a smile on my face now no no mention guys we're not trying to say we hate brits okay i I love england guys yeah i do too but in the sense of the game he just he was a very capable opponent I, i think when it comes down to part three of assassin's creed that game really depicted what a character would be like if they had assassin that kind of training back then and you're putting them up against soldiers who have no clue how to deal with somebody like that. And that is why I felt that Connor was so good in that game. You know, he was doing things that, you know, was just not seen back then, you know, especially in terms of combat. I agree. I agree. And I like to, and it was a great progression in that sense. And this is one of the things that I do like, and I do like to mention that I am a character. I look at character and story over. I I just look at the characters and how they interact with the world around them. Yeah, I've always seen myself as a character guy over a a, a glitz and glamour, flashy aspect to anything in media mm. because if you just put too much into how something looks you kind of lose the character and the story it, it, they go they go they go to the background where the effects are in the foreground and that can't happen and that's and honestly I would much rather have characters doing their own thing and be happy about it now, how do you feel about the fourth game? They're taking it now to Connor's grandfather. Uh, I'm, I'm excited because it's assassins and pirates. You have a thrill for pirates. I do like pirates. I do. It's just, eh, well, for me, I love the sea. Yeah, I love the ocean even though I have a, in, uh, a huge fear of deep water. 
but I love the ocean. Now, in your opinion, Tony, where do you see the Assassin's Creed franchise going after this one? Do you where do you want it to go? Where do you want it to go? In all honesty, the the way I want it to go is to you know explore different facets of time with a a new person uh, entering in the uh, animus, like a new character for the series to continue, and just to see how their ancestors became capable assassins. I mean, I I I will wait for the now wait till the end of time for an Assassin's Creed game set in World War One. I'm willing to wait for that one. The same way I would wait for one set in World War II, which I know for a fact will never happen. Though one thing would be interesting to see is an Assassin's Creed game set during the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte. Wow. You know, that's just me talking. Chris says he, wants, sure. he wants one during the Age of the Samurai. Which... From what I've heard is uh, we're not going to get that. Yeah. And, and there's some things that we wish for but we can't get, which is just sad. You know, some cool ideas and concepts are thrown out there and they just get crumpled up and tossed in the trash. Okay. And that's sad. That's really sad. Now, for your final question, um, well, it's kind of a two-parter, but uh, overall, your experiences being a part of the core, how do you, how would you rate it? Um, are there any members that you would like to collaborate more with? Uh, just give me your piece. Well, I'm, I actually love being a part of this group. I'm talking to people who I can just discuss things with on a on a level about comics or anything that we tend to discuss like films and all that stuff and I just like hanging out with everyone and just talking to all the members it, it doesn't really matter to me who the next person I collaborate with or who I want to collaborate with as long as I keep talking to these great people, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that, 100%. Now, Chris says that he looks at the group as his brothers and sisters. Even me and the fact that he's the oldest out of them, he does kind of have... Does he have that big brother mentality when he's around you guys, or is it... He just you, he just feels like he's one of the he just welcomes everybody in open arms. You know, I have a belief that my close but all my friends doesn't matter which group they're a part of. Uh, that either being my friends in theater, my friends here in the YouTube community, they're all my family, and I view them as such because my personal belief I would lay my life on the line to defend my family whether it's biological or just good friends who i deem my second family i would fight for them till the day i die and i said that would be your last question but i have one more and i want to know have you met chris's mentor blue goblin you know what, I actually, I met him, but never really got the chance to talk to him, in all honesty. <laughs> but from what I've seen, of, he he seems like a really cool guy to hang out with. Is there anything else you would like to get off your chest? Oh, well, one thing that I, I usually love to talk about, hey, I did an entire 30 days talking about it, is my love for Super Sentai. <laughs> I was going to save that for last, but go ahead. Get it out. 
Ah, oh, Super Sentai. Now this is Power Rangers over here, guys. That's the original name, if you don't know what that is. And well, what Super Sent? Well, I actually do a, a compare a compare and contrast show on Bravo Team talking about uh, how what the Sentai series did with the concept over the and compared it to what they did here in the States in terms of Power Rangers. Although there's only one episode of, for that series that's out now, because here's the deal for me. When I'm comparing two different series, I have to watch both series and follow through the storylines and compare the characters while I'm doing it. So, and the average Super Sentai series is... Roughly 50 episodes, whereas some Power Ranger series are close to 35. Well, limit in the Disney era was 33 for the most part, but still, you get my point. <laughs> so it'll, it's a time-consuming process, but it will be done when it's done. Kind of like what uh, Lee Kara does with his History of Power Rangers videos. He has to watch every episode in that series and write them down so he can discuss, so he can put it in a video. And that's kind of what I do, but I don't write things down. I keep them in my head. <laughs> okay. So there you have it, guys. Um, another interview down for uh, another member of the core. Um, we were talking with uh, Serpentine. 451, uh, Mr. Tony. Um, and I want to thank you, sir, for doing this and letting me enjoy you. We went a long time. So far, I believe this is the longest out of the interview so far. Uh, oh, I believe so. Because knowing me, I'm a bit of a chatterbox. <laughs> I like to talk, 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 talk. And the only way you can stop me is with food, uh, something to drink. Or I'm distracted by something else. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, though, um, it was very pleasant getting to know you. And I hope you guys got to learn a little bit more about uh, one of the YouTuber core members. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. And if you have some questions for him, please feel free to leave it in the description when Chris uploads this video. Um, and I'm sure Tony will be gladly to answer them, honestly and mm -hmm. truthfully. That I will. Uh, and this whole interviewing process, actually a really fun experience, and I am just having a blast with it, you know? I like answering questions. <laughs> so, but other than that, guys, um, thank you for listening. Um, I will move, we will someday in the future move on to the next member uh perhaps it'll be we don't know i don't know i get the i get it from chris he tells me who's going to be next uh from what i hear maybe somebody else may take over the interviewing mm -hmm. interview, so we don't know but yeah, i know nothing <laughs> but it will probably be as always he keeps in touch with all the members and what's going on uh it'd be great to get to review one of the ladies of the group that would that'd be so much fun um but other than that uh thank you mr tony and i hope you guys enjoyed and uh you guys take care and we'll see you next time on another one-on-one -on -one interview have a pleasant day <laughs>